This program is designed to provide general information with regards to the subject matters covered. This information is given with the understanding that neither the hosts, guests, sponsors, or station are engaged in rendering any specific and personal medical, financial, legal, counseling, professional service, or any advice. You should seek the services of competent professionals before applying or trying any suggested ideas. Good morning, Truth Seekers. We are back with Hit the Road Jack, Finding the Zodiac. Last week, we concluded the handwriting identification of the Zodiac Killer Communications compared to Jack Terrence. I did want to make note that I had a comment last week from somebody who indicated they wanted to have Don Cheney's handwriting looked at. <clears throat> I thought that was a rather strange request since this presentation has... Um, identify Jack Terrence as the author of those letters, but I'm always down to take a look. I have examined other handwritings in regards to this case. Um, I do charge a fee for doing that. So if whoever it was that brought up Don Cheney's information would like to engage my services for a handwriting examination, we could certainly break that down. I, I hope you have a lot of handwriting. Obviously, um, a couple pages of um, known handwriting printed as well would be perfect. So um, let's go ahead and move on to this week's presentation. I'm actually going to start with a um, graphology reading of Jack's handwriting. So I attend a graphology class weekly and we cover different handwritings from different people to behavioral trait their handwriting to determine who they are and how they behave. Uh, in this group, they put up some handwriting and then everybody in the group who is on the, the Zoom meeting at that point in time has an option to um, put in their input or what they see in the characteristics of the handwriting that kind of determines or talks about that individual's good and bad points. These are some of the things that they came up with. Um, first person said he was smart. Another said he had good character, organized, secretive, and private, depressed, detail-oriented, concentration. Um, there was a military aspect because he dots all his I's and crosses all of his T's, keeping his ego in check, receiving pressure from bosses or persons above him. That's that bell top A. Issues with his chain of command. He has outbursts and he has control. That is such a Zodiac Jack 101. Jealousy, he's in charge, he's rebellious, he has a temper, does not get close to others and takes his space. He's protecting, uncomfortable, suspicious, leery and watching, philosophical. He has a go to hell trait or defiance. And finally, one last analyst actually spouted out that he would have been perfect for the CIA. Now, they had no idea that the handwriting sample that they were looking at was my suspect in the Zodiac case. I did not give them that information. But I thought that those were very interesting traits that they read from Jack's handwriting. It happened to be one of his um, formal reports that he wrote as a sergeant in security for Hewlett Packard. Uh, I do intend and have already given out additional samples of handwriting to one particular um, graphologist who is going to begin analyzing both the Zodiac's handwriting and Jack's handwriting at the same time. And we'll cover those findings. And she is happy to be a guest on the show once I reach that point. So now I'm going to go ahead and flip us back to the presentation. Um, here we, I, I re-ran this letter because I believe that um, this letter is very important to the mindset of the suspect or the killer. 
It was written November 1st, 1967 in regards to the murder of Sherry Jo Bates. It is written to the editor, which we know that's a huge Zodiac thing, even though this was Riverside activity that he claimed later in his um, letters to law enforcement and the media. It says your human interest story, October 1st, 1967 about Sherry. The RCC girl that was killed was very interesting. Perhaps a story about the boy that killed her could be more rewarding. If people were to read of the life of a boy that turned killer, they might stop to think about the lives of their own children. Are we laying the blue? Ugh, are we laying the blueprint for another killer? Might be one of the questions brought to mind by such a story. With hope, Patricia Houts, fellow student. So in my opinion, this is from the, the suspect who calls himself the Zodiac Killer. He was trying to tell people who and what he was. We see attempts that this killer has made where he is trying to get what he believes to be the real story told. And we'll see that as a common theme throughout the communications. A typewritten letter is one of the many ways he used over the decades to create confusion, fear, and terror. Um, each, each time he chooses a different method of communication, we still find that it is it is uh, within the realm or the arsenal of the Zodiac Killer, whether it is block printing, typewritten matter, um, hand, uh, hand printing, and cut and paste out of magazines and newspapers. So the typewritten letter is just one of the ways and we actually find that one of the very first letters in the series that we're going to look at is is typewritten and i do plan on doing some examinations to it i did notice some some similarities in the keystrokes so i would like to actually analyze the typewritten matter itself in comparison to this particular letter and see if we find that these keys are a match um so basically keeping the country on their toes for more than 60 years requires a great deal of sophistication, technical expertise, and a cloak and dagger lifestyle fully protected from prosecution. And we're going to see how Jack actually escaped many, many attempts at being arrested. So to fully understand where this has come from and where it has went to, we should start with the birth of the suspect. Um, I believe that authored the Zodiac Killer Communications. Common characteristics between the serial killers are a childhood developed in violence, turmoil, desperation, and abuse. Most serial killers show a propensity for anger and killing, causing pain to small animals and weaker people. Jack shows all of the traits or characteristics that a serial killer would state they were exposed to during their childhood, as you'll soon see. I will show you through Jack's own paper trail stories from Dennis Kaufman and other family members and a trail of murders for over 60 years. Um, I'm not sure how one person can have such a proximity in relation to so many murders if they are not that suspect or write like each of the suspects from those murders. Right. See if I can get this thing going. Okay, so I also wanted to start with why I got so involved with this particular um, case. So before we start with Jack's life, I just want to give you a brief um, introduction to me and Dennis Kaufman. So when I entered into forensic document examination, I became part of a school that was located in Texas. I was told that I was the only person in the California area and that um, it was a wide open area for me. 10 months after I began my apprenticeship, my mentor actually moved himself in the school out here to California. And I think it was in regards to this particular case. He, the uh, mentor also gave me an altered letter, which we'll look at here. This is the Melvin Belli letter. Again, we talked a little bit about this and how copybook print this was. It's not natural writing. They tried to write with um, precision and the um, most of the, characteristics or the subconscious characteristics that occur in handwriting are missing from this type of writing. So if another person tells me again that they've made a handwriting match to this letter solely, um, we've got something to talk about and the world should not believe this. Almost perfect copy books should never be compared to natural handwriting. I only found 20 natural traits that someone could count on in this particular letter and all 20 of those traits matched Jack. There are multiple facets of each letter, both capital and lowercase with a natural variation that should be examined for all aspects, which is why I continued to look for additional writings in the Zodiac case. Uh, 
So stop saying you've made an identification of this letter. That is a facade. It has been altered in order to pretend, uh, prevent an identification as well. I've been told that this particular document, when it was presented to me as an eight and a half by 11, was um, in fact blown up or the pixels had been um, manipulated in order to present it to the public. So it was increased a thousand percent by a thousand percent in the in the pixels. And I had um, a client who is an IT guy and he is the one that actually looked at the properties of this document to determine that it was not the actual size this document was when it was originally scanned in. Um, let's go back. So, after I had explained who Jack was and that he was a security guard, he told me to take it on for entertainment, that he wasn't smart enough. He was working on a book and a documentary with a person who wrote like the Zodiac and had the Zodiac hood and Paul Stein's glasses. He claimed that this person had a genetic predisposition and wrote the Belli letter at the age of seven years old, which I find to be a complete impossibility for any seven-year-old to write with such perfect writing. Um, also that she rode around with the Zodiac when he committed his crimes. Again, that is just absurd. Um, he didn't open my work. He declined my opinion based on that altered letter stating that the writing was too large and that my client or my suspect's writing was too small. So we didn't have a match, but he never once opened up my work to actually take a look at it. He had a second opinion administered that I didn't ask for. Um, I was called in the middle of a math class by one of the mentors in our school who indicated that I was wrong and I should not release my opinion. Um, I didn't ask for the second opinion, so it kind of caught me off guard. But during the conversation, I found that he had not opened up my work either. So literally two mentors telling me I'm wrong when they didn't even look at what I had prepared. And I had spent hours and hours putting together this presentation. Um, he told me, uh, I was told at one point I was in over my head. I questioned that only because in this line of work, you can cost people their livelihoods, whether it be an inheritance, a job, um, their freedom. They can go to jail over some of these findings. Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't believe that I could be on the stand and testifying in cases if I didn't know what I was doing in document examination. He assured me that it wasn't in the area of document examination, that I was absolutely fine there. So that led me to believe what possibly could he have meant that I was in over my head. Either way, when I had determined that I believed there was an identification to be made, um, I was told as an apprentice that I could not release my opinion without the approval or um, the peer review of my mentor. And so, there was a quandary. My client, Dennis Kaufman, wanted me to release this opinion to CBS 13 News, and my mentor did not want me to. He even threatened to kick me out of the school, in which case I was going to lose my fees that I paid to attend. Uh, I was five months away from actually ending or completing my apprenticeship as a document examiner, and it made me literally sick to my stomach for about a week. And then finally he called me and he said that since Dennis did not pay me, that I was not contracted with the school to have to have that peer review or um, opinion by my mentor before I could release it to the public. So I, after about a week, I was getting, you know, I, I was having a hard time because I was going to college at the same time. So studying and I had finals and things that were going on that this was clearly messing up. Got a couple B's in some classes during the high points of these um, cases, which didn't make me necessarily proud, but I was glad at least that I made it through with um, a decent enough grade that um, I didn't beat myself up over it. So I rendered my opinion on CBS 13 News with Chris Pickle. And 30 days later, we saw Deborah Perez appear on the steps of the Chronicle with the disbarred partner of Melon, Melvin Belli. Again, back to this Melvin Belli letter. Here we have a disbarred attorney now acting as a PR person for Deborah Perez, who claimed that she was the seven-year-old that wrote the Belli letter and that she traveled around with the Zodiac while he killed. <clears throat> 
Um, San Francisco PD was acclaimed with giving her hundreds of man hours to investigate her story. Um, in that, they found that they were not Paul Stein's glasses. I don't know what the disposition of the hood was, but needless to say, we've seen her go back underneath her rock from where she came. And at the time she was out there doing this, I was doing some research on the internet and found her to be out there claiming she was the love child of John F. Kennedy. So I'm not sure how much um, investigating they did into Deborah Perez alone. Um, needless to say, nothing ever amounted to it and we don't hear from her anymore. From that point, I went ahead and did an episode with Aphrodite Jones on true crimes. It was the Zodiac special. And of course, she indicated on that special that her contacts at the FBI had also determined that the handwriting was a match, even though the um, actual examination that was completed on my behalf with the work that I provided to the FBI came back with what was quite a bit of a joke of an opinion letter that stated he may have written or Jack may have written the letters, he may not have written the letters. Either way, um, I was then contacted by uh, Jan Gay, who is the biological daughter of Guy Ward Hendrickson, and that is the individual that Deborah Perez was claiming was the Zodiac. After examining the handwriting, um, we found, or I found that the handwriting of Guy Ward Hendrickson was not that of the Zodiac Killer. And I once again appeared on CBS 13 News. We um, had the Associated Press show up with a couple other people. Unfortunately, that very same day, Michael Jackson had passed away and that basically covered all of the news. And I'm pretty sure that what I had to say about Guy Ward Hendrickson was not that big of a deal. So I also found out that my mentor was on an episode of America's Most Wanted with John Walsh and Tom Voigt um, talking about the Zodiac Killer. And he most definitely knew the difference of the consistency of the letters and what he had provided me. So I kind of feel like I was actually given the letter, um, the initial letter in hopes that I wouldn't have figured this out. All right, so let's get into Jack. So Jack Terrence, born February 6, 1928. He is the oldest son of John Walker Terrence and Ina Flova Barnett. There have been lots of fines in regards to the word Flova in some of the ciphers. So you can literally actually find the word Flova in these, which is interesting because Jack was really in love with his mother. Um, this is the beginning of something very tyrannical. One of five children, Jack seemed to do things a bit different than the rest. Jack's birth is actually registered in Stamford County, which is across the Jones County line. But Jack was actually born on the same farm as his father, approximately three miles from Peacock, Texas in Stonewall County. Um, the first letter that we find that I talk about, the typewritten letter is a written confession of the crime and turning himself in. It was actually left on a stone wall in Southern California. So Jack's life also seems to have crossed jurisdictions as we're gonna discuss with the Zodiac Killer. Um, and it, I, I find that it's really just a, a bittersweet irony. So here is a picture taken in 1932. It is Jack Terrence and his sister, Billy Joyce, and their two grandfathers at the time. So in 1932, at the height of the Dust Bowl and Great Depression, Jack loses his sister, Billy Joyce, at the age of three from pneumonia created by the Dust Bowl, which took many lives during this period. And just to kind of let everybody know, I do um, complete research as I am putting this presentation together. So we will be hearing about some of the facts and some of the history that goes along with this, if only to remind people where we came from and what Jack was involved with. In approximately 1933, uh, Jack watched his father shoot a man in the head with a shotgun over a liquor bottle and some drug money when he was approximately five years old. John Terrence, Jack's father, knew the judge and was given a five-year suspended sentence. Unbelievable. Jack's surviving sister, Ella Dean, aka Sue Ellen Cade, committed a bank robbery and was arrested and given 20 years in federal prison. Um, she would take care of Flova once she got out of prison until her own death on January 12th of 1992. I just thought it was 
kind of interesting that a female committing a bank robbery at that time was kind of amazing, or at least unheard of for the most part. Um, so a short bio on Jack's parents. Jack's father, John Walker Terrence, was 29, year, 29 years old based on the information on the back of the picture, uh, born in 1909 and married to Flova by 1927 at the age of 18. John was said to have had one hell of a temper, which of course Jack did too. Jack's mother married his father at the age of 15 years old and was already pregnant with Jack, delivered her first child at the age of 16. Um, she was born January 17th, 1912, and 26 years old at the time of this particular picture that was taken. Um, Flova was touted to have been an admirer of Bonnie Parker, who was famously known as Bonnie and Clyde. John was a farmer and a moonshiner, so his fa Jack's father worked out of town during the week, um, I'm told was a long-haul trucker, and it was said that... Um, he would punish Jack with a razor strap on Saturday for everything that Jack had done during the previous week. So these beatings were brutal and a means for Jack's father to release his anger. Um, the beatings, I also believe, set the platform for the torture and the pain that Jack would one day instill on others. The theory that many of these killings took place on Saturday night or early Sunday morning was because of Jack's rage for his father and maybe even following the solstices of the Farmer's Almanac rather than a zodiac sign since it started well before that moniker had been established and that Jack grew up on the ranch and completely understood the solstices. At some point, Jack became the man of the house while John was gone. One of the earlier and maybe one of the um, uh, mimicry type murders that the Zodiac committed was this particular uh, murder of Bob Lord in 1938. So this gentleman was from San Diego, California. He traveled to New Orleans where he ended up dead and pinned to him was this particular note that said he accidentally knew too much, too bad. And we see one of the first Zodiac symbols that um, have been included in a communication, or at least to my knowledge, I've not seen anything outside of the Zodiac case that has it. So this might have been something that Jack mimicked, or Jack may have been part of the same organization that believed that this man knew too much. Um, if Jack's father shot a man in the face in front of Jack and was said to work out of town during the week, how are we to know that Jack just didn't follow in his dad's footsteps? What exactly did his father do for work? These are things I don't have answers for. Um, I know that the only clue they said to the mysterious murder was this printed letter found on the gentleman and that he had stopped to visit a friend in Kansas who had indicated to the police that he was um, being followed or he felt he was being followed by somebody that was... Um, wanting to kill him. So again, these are old stories. We don't know what the truth of them are. And I can find limited information, which includes some of the newspaper clippings on this. Um, 1935 to 1938, we also had the Cleveland Torso murderer going on. Um, he was using typewritten letters as well, saying, you can rest easy now as I've come out to um, sunny California. Winter felt bad. Winter felt bad operating on these people, and the rest of that letter is illegible. However, um, the individual's name is Jack Anderson, and he was one of the major suspects, actually, for the um, Black Dahlia murder and the murders during that time frame. Chances are that Jack may have met this man since Jack traveled by the railway and the Cleveland Torso murder. Um, was actually abducting homeless people or train riders, people who hopped trains to get around, and he was cutting off heads and bisecting them and doing things of this nature. So here's another picture, basically, of Bob Lord next to Miss Shirley Bob Jones. She's the one that indicated that Bob Lord felt that he had um, had somebody following him that was um, wishing to do him harm. The um, police department ruled it a suicide. However, the coroner ruled that it, he had been shot through his hat and there were no 
uh, stippling marks. There was no um, there was no residue from a close up gun being fired into the hat. So they didn't see any of the gunpowder or the things they would have anticipated to see had he shot himself at close range. So we have two different um, views here, police suicide, coroner, homicide. In New Orleans, LA and Los Angeles, California were two major cities ran by the underground mafia syndicate, um, the media and the newspapers, TV, Hollywood, Dow Chemicals, JP Morgan, Chase, politicians, mafia leaders, casinos, and anyone else who might use the CIA for security. Some of the power uh, moves and the happenings of World War II I thought was pertinent to go through. Um, I came across some research and of course I just allow the research to take me wherever it goes. This just happened to be some things that were occurring just before the murders from Jack began. Um, I'm going to read some things in regards to what was going on in politics because I think politics plays a big part in this presentation. And it basically goes on to say three Bush family alliances. The government must put the most modern medical means in the service of this knowledge. Those who are physically and mentally unhealthy and unworthy must not perpetuate their suffering in the body of their children. The prevention of the faculty and opportunity to procreate on the part of the physically degenerate and mentally sick over a period of only 600 years would free humanity from an immeasurable misfortune. The per capita income gap between the developed and the developing countries is increasing, in large part the result of higher birth rates in the poorer countries. Famine in India, unwanted babies in the United States, poverty that seemed to be form seem to form an unbreakable chain for millions of people. How should we tackle these problems? It is quite clear that one of the major challenges of the 1970s will be to curb the world's fertility. And if anybody actually follows the um the uh, population or the, oh, I'm trying to find a good word for this. Yeah, we actually seen an influx. So at one point in time, people were having many children because that's what it took to raise the farm um, to a point where we literally were down to having one to two children per family. We've actually seen that climb back up and we've started to see um, more children being born to families. Um, but if you follow history, you can actually see when that occurs, when birth control is invented, when um, other options like abortions are given. Anyways, these two quotations are, are alike in their mock show of concern for human suffering and their cynical remedy for it. Big Brother must prevent the unworthy or unwanted people from living. Let us now further inquire into the family background of our president so as to help illustrate how the second quoted author, George Bush, came to share the outlook of the first Adolf Hitler. We will examine here the alliance of the Bush family with three other families, Farish, Draper, and Gray. The private associations among these families have led to the president's relationship to his closest, most confidential advisors. These alliances were forged in the earlier Hitler project and its immediate aftermath. Understanding them will help us to explain George Bush's obsession with the supposed overpopulation of the world's non-Anglo-Saxons, non-whites, and the dangerous means he has adopted to deal with this problem. Bush and Farish, when, Bush, when George Bush was elected vice president in 1980, Texas mystery man William Stance Farish III took over management of all of George Bush's personal wealth in a blind trust. Known as one of the richest men in Texas, Will Farish keeps his business affairs under the most intense secrecy. Only the source of his immense wealth is known, not its employment. Will Farish has long been Bush's closest friend and confidant. He is also the unique private host to Britain's Queen Elizabeth. Farish owns and boards the studs which mate with the queen's mares. That is her public rationale when she comes to America and stays in Farish's house. It is a vital link in the mind of our Anglophile president. President Bush can count on Farish not to betray the violent secrets surrounding the Bush family money, for Farish's own family fortune was made in the same Hitler project in a nightmarish partnership with George Bush's father. On March 25, 1942, U.S. Assistant Attorney General Thurman Ar Arnold announced that William Stamps Farish, grandfather of the president's money manager, had pleaded no contest to charges of criminal conspiracy with the Nazis. 
Farish was the principal manager of a worldwide, worldwide cartel between Standard Oil Company, which we will be talking about Standard Oil Company of New Jersey and the IG Farben concern. They mer the merged enterprise had opened the Auschwitz slave labor camp on June 14, 1940 to produce artificial rubber and gasoline from coal. The Hitler government supplied political opponent opponents and Jews as slaves who were worked to near death and then murdered. Arnold disclosed that Standard Oil of New Jersey, later known as Exxon, of which Farish was president and chief executive, had agreed to stop hiding from the United States patents for artificial rubber, which the company had provided to the Nazis. A Senate investigating committee under Senator, later U.S. President Harry Truman of Missouri, had called Arnold to testify at hearings on corporations' collaboration with the Nazis. The senators expressed outrage at the cynical way Farish was continuing an alliance with the Hitler regime that had begun back in 1933 when Farish became chief of Jersey Standard. Didn't, know, didn't he know there was a war on? Might be a question somebody asks. The Justice Department laid before the committee a letter written to Standard President Farish by his vice president shortly after beginning of World War II, September 1st, 1939 in Europe. The letter concerned a renewal of their earlier agreements with the Nazis. The report on European trip October 12th, 1939, Mr. W.S. Farish, 30 Rockefeller Plaza, Plaza is where it was written to. Dear Mr. Farish, I stayed in France until September 17th. In England, I met by appointment the Royal Dutch Shell Oil Company gentleman from Holland, and a general agreement was reached on the necessary changes in our relation with the IG Farben in view of the state of war. The Royal Dutch Shell Group is essentially British. I also had several meetings with the British Air Ministry. I required help to obtain the necessary permission to go to Holland. After discussions with the American ambassador, Joseph Kennedy, the situation was com cleared completely. The gentleman in the air ministry very kindly offered to assist me later in re-entering England. Pursuant to these agreements, I was able to keep my appointments in Holland, having flown there on a British Royal Air Force bomber, where I had three days of discussion with the representative IG, they delivered to me assignments of some 2,000 foreign patents, and we did our best to work out complete plans for a modus vivendi, which would, could operate through the term of the war, whether or not the U.S. came in. Emphasis added, very truly yours, Frank A. Howard. Here are some cold realities behind the tragedy of World War II, which help explain the bush farish family alliance and their peculiar closeness to the Queen of England. Shell Oil is principally owned by the British Royal Family. Shell's chairman, Sir Henry de Terting, helping helped sponsor Hitler's rise to power by arrangement with the Royal Family's Bank of England, Governor Montagu Norman. Their ally, Standard Oil, would take part in the Hitler projects right up to the bloody, gruesome end. When Grandfather Farish signed the Justice Department's consent decree in March 1942, government had already started picking its way through the tangled web of world monopoly oil and chemical agreements between Standard Oil and the Nazis. Many patents and other Nazi-owned aspects of the partnership had been seized by the U.S. alien property custodian. Uncle Sam would not seize President Bush's Union Banking Corporation for another seven months. So there was actually... Um, we did see some stateside resolution to some of these deeds that were occurring, but these were big money-making times for these individuals. The bush Ferris axis had begun back in 1929, and in that year, the Harriman Bank bought Dresser Industries, supplier of oil pipeline couplers to Standard and other companies. Prescott Bush became a director and financial czar of the Dresser um, industry, installing his Yale classmate Neil Mellon as chairman. George Bush would later name one of his sons after the dresser executive. That's a big deal. William S. Farish was the main organizer of the Humble Oil Company. So we are going to hear about Humble Oil during this process as well. So it's interesting that a lot of the research that I've come up with or that this particular um, report really touches on the basis of a lot of things we're going to see. Um, so Humble Oil Company of Texas, which is where Jack fr is from, um, Farish mer merged into the Standard Oil Company of New Jersey. Farish built up the humble standard empire of pipelines and refineries in Texas. 
The start, stock market crashed just after the Bush family got into the oil business and the world financial crisis led to the merger of Walker Harriman Bank with Brown Brothers in 1931. Former Brown partner Montago Norman and his protege, Mr. Schott, who was to become Hitler's uh, economic minister paid frantic visits to New York that year and the next, preparing the new Hitler regime for Germany. Then we have the Congress on Eugenics. The most important American political event in those preparations for Hitler was the infamous Third International Congress of Eugenics held at the New York's American Museum of Natural History on August 21st through the 23rd of 1932, supervised by the International Federation of Eugenic Societies. I didn't know these kind of things existed. So I'm kind of blown away when you hear about it. And when people talk about population control, I think there might actually be something to this. It is supervised by the International Federation of Eugenics Society. This meeting took up the stubborn persistence of African Americans and other allegedly inferior and socially inadequate groups in reproducing, expanding their numbers and amalgamating with others. It was recommended that these dangers to the better ethnic groups, wow, um, and to the well-born could be dealt with by sterilization or cutting off the bad stock or the unfit. Italy's fascist government sent an, an official representative, Avril Harriman's sister, Mary, director of entertainment for the Congress, lived in downtown, lived downtown in Virginia, fox hunting country. Her state supplied the speaker on racial purity. W.A. Plecker, Virginia Commissioner of Vital Statistics. Plecker reportedly held the delegate spellbound with this account of the struggle to stop race mixing and interracial sex in Virginia. Again, wow. What we what we don't know from the past um, can be very enlightening for our future. The Congress proceedings were dedicated to Avril Harriman's mother. She had paid for the founding of the race science movement in America back in 1910, building the Eugen eugenics record office as a branch of the Galton National laboratory in London. She and other Harrimans were usually escorted to the horse races by old George Herbert Walker. They shared with the Bushes and the Farishes a fascination with breeding thoroughbreds among horses and humans. Avril Harriman personally arranged with the Walker Bush Hamburg America line to transport Nazi ideologues from Germany to New York for this meeting. The most famous among this transported was Dr. Ernst Rudin, psychiatrist at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Genealogy and and demography in Berlin, where the Rockefeller family paid for Dr. Rudin to occupy an entire floor with his eugenics research. Dr. Rudin had addressed inter the International Federation's 1928 Munich meeting, speaking on mental aberration and race hygiene. While other Germans and Americans spoke on race mixing and sterilization of the unfit, Rudin had led the German delegation to the 1930 Mental Hygiene Congress in Washington, D.C. Oh, too much sometimes. At the Harriman's 1932 New York Eugenics Congress, Ernst Rudin was unanimously elected president of the International Federation of Eugenics Societies. This was recognition of Rudin as founder of the German Society for Race and Hygiene with his co-founder, Eugenics Federation Vice President Alfred Plotz. As depression maddened financiers schemed in Berlin and New York, Rudin was now official leader of the world eugenics movement. Components of his movement includes groups with overlapping leadership dedicated to sterilization of mental patients, mental hygiene societies, execution of the insane, criminals, and the terminally ill, euthanasia, euthanasia societies, and eugenic race purification by prevention of births to parents from inferior blood stocks or birth control societies. Before the Auschwitz death camp became a household word, these British American European groups called openly for the elimination of the unfit by means including force and violence. 10 months later, in June of 1933, Hitler's interior minister, Wilhelm Frick, spoke to a eugenics meeting in the New Third Reich. Frick called the Germans a degenerate race, denouncing one fifth of Germany's parents for producing feeble-minded and defective children. The following month on a commission by Frick, Dr. Ernst Rudin wrote the law for the prevention of hereditary diseases in posterity. The sterilization law modeled on previous U.S. statutes in Virginia and other states. 
Mm -hmm. Special courts were soon established for the sterilization of German mental patients, the blind, the deaf, and alcoholics. A quarter million people in these categories were sterilized. Rudin, Plotz, and their colleagues trained a whole generation of physicians and psychiatrists as sterilizers and as killers. Adolf Hitler was not the sole source of such genocidal policies. They were, in fact, an integral part of the overall Nazi philosophy from the beginning of World War I. When the war started, the eugenicists, doctors, and psychiatrists staffed the new T4 agency, which planned and supervised the mass killings, first at euthanasia centers, where the same categories which had first been subject to sterilization were now to be murdered. Their brains sent in lots of 200 to experimental psychiatrists, then at slave camps such as Auschwitz, a and finally for Jews and other race victims at straight extermination camps in Poland, such as Treblinka and Belsen. In 1933, as the Hitler called his new order, appeared John D. Rockefeller Jr. appointed William S. Farish, the chairman of Standard Oil Company of New Jersey. In 1937, he was made president and chief executive. Farish moved his offices to Rockefeller Center um, New York, where he spent a good deal of time with Herman Schmitz, chairman of IG Farben. His company paid a publicity man, Ivy Lee, to write pro-IG Farben and pro-Nazi pro propaganda and get it into the U.S. press. So again, the, uh, the media is helping to perpetuate these beliefs as well. Now that he was outside of Texas, Farish found himself in the shipping business like the Bush family. He hired Nazi German crews for standard oil tankers, and he hired Emil Helferich, chairman of the Walker Bush Harriman Hamburg America Line, as chairman also of the Standard Oil Company subsidiary in Germany. Carl Lindman, board member of Hamburg America, also became a top Farish standard executive in Germany. This interlock between their Nazi German operations put Farish together with Prescott Bush in a small select group of men operating from abroad through Hitler's rev revolution and calculating that they would never be punished. Well, when you have that kind of money, <laughs> there's, yeah, there's a chance you're not going to be pu punished. In 1939, Farish's daughter Martha married Avril Harriman's nephew, Edward Harriman Gary, and Farish in-laws became Prescott Bush's partners at 59 Broadway. So, joining of the families. Both Emil Helfrick and Carl Lindemann were authorized to write checks to Henrik Himmler, chief of the Nazi SS, on a special standard oil account. This account was managed by the German-British-American banker, Kurt von Schroeder. According to U.S. intelligence documents reviewed by author Anthony Sutton, Helfrick continued his payments to the SS into 1944, when the SS was supervised the mass murder at the standard IG Farben, Auschwitz, and other death camps. Helfrich told ally interrogators after the war that these were not his personal contributions, they were corporate standard oil funds. So corporations were actually assisting in facilitating and financing what was going on during World War I. After pleading no contest to charges of criminal conspiracy with the Nazis, William Stamps Farish was fined $5,000. That was huge. Similar fines were levied against Standard Oil, $5,000 each for the parent company and for several subsidiaries. This, of course, did not interfere with the millions of dollars that Farish had acquired in conjunction with the Hitler's new order as a large stockholder, chairman, and president of Standard Oil. All the government... I got five minutes. Um, all the government sought was the use of patents, which his company had given to the Nazis, the Auschwitz patents, but had withheld from the U.S. military and industry. But a, war, but a war was on, and if young men were to be asked to die fighting Hitler, something more was needed. Farish was hauled before the Senate committee investigating the National Defense Program. The committee chairman, Senator Harry Truman, told newsmen before Farish testified, I think this approaches treason. Farish began breaking apart these hearings. He shouted his indignation at the senators and claimed he was not disloyal. After the March-April hearings ended, more dirt came gushing out of the Justice Department and the Congress on Farish and Standard Oil. Farish had deceived the U.S. Navy to pre prevent the Navy from acquiring certain patents while supplying them to the Nazi war machine. Meanwhile, he was supplying gasoline and tetrathol 
led to Germans, submarines, and air force. Communications between Standard and IG Farben from the outbreak of World War II were released to the Senate, showing that Farish's organization had arranged to deceive the U.S. government into passing over Nazi-owned assets. They would nominally buy IG's share in certain patents because in the event of war between ourselves and Germany, it would certainly be very undesirable to have this 20% standard IG pass to an alien property custodian of the U.S. who might sell it to an unfriendly interest. I'm going to kind of drop it right there. We do probably still have, oh, it looks like two more slides, slide and a half basically, before I'm going to jump back into Jack's life. I just wanted to make note of some of these early beginnings. Like I said, we're going to hear a lot about these particular individuals throughout this um, um, presentation. And my goal at this point has been to follow the money. I want to know why Jack was doing what he was doing and who he was doing it for. I'm not as astute in history as most people, so some of the things I've brought in, you may or may not want to um, to call me on it, to uh, fact check it, to let me know if I have something wrong. But again, I'm just kind of rolling with where the research and the investigation leads me as I'm looking through Jack's life and the crimes that are being committed. Um, I hope that next week we are going to see the first of the murder series that we have and we're going to look at some um, cipher solves using anagrams. We're going to um, look at the murders that I think started the Zodiac's um, serial killing life because like I said, I don't believe that he picked up one day, killed seven people, wrote hundreds of communications to media and law enforcement just to fall off the earth the next day. Um, he definitely started somewhere, and we're going to get to see that next week. Oh, well, maybe I have a couple minutes. Um, yep, let's see if we can finish this slide. John D. Rockefeller Jr., father of David Nelson and John D. Rockefeller III, the controlling owner of Standard Oil, told the Roosevelt and Roosevelt, we're gonna hear a lot about Roosevelt. In fact, that seems to be one of the primary stamps or actually first call outs in some of the first crime sprees that we'll see. Told the Roosevelt administration that he knew nothing of the day-to-day -day affairs of his company, that all these matters were handled by Farish and other executives. It's always nice not to know. In August, Farish was brought back for more testimony. He was now frequently accused of lying. Farish was crushed under the intense public grilling. He became morose and ashen. While Prescott Bush escaped publicity when the government seized his Nazi banking organization in October, Farish had been nailed. They always have a fall guy. Um, he collapsed and died of a heart attack on November, Farish collapsed and died of a heart attack on November 29th, 1942. The Farish family was devastated by the exposure. Son William Stamps Farish Jr., a lieutenant in the Army Air Force, was humiliated by the public knowledge that his father was fueling the enemy's aircraft. He died in a training accident in Texas six months later. Convenient or purpose? With this double death, the fortune compromising much of Standard Oil's profit from Texas and Nazi Germany was now to be settled upon the little four-year-old grandson, William Stamps Farish III. Will Farish grew up a recluse, the most secretive multimillionaire in Texas, with investments of that money in a multitude of foreign countries and a host of exotic contacts over overlapping the intelligence and financial worlds, particularly in Britain. All right, so next week we're going to move on to the final bit of things that are going on during this time frame before we climb right back into Jack's life. Everybody take care, have a good week, and we'll see you next Friday.